slide showing a coronary artery. Now what has happened in this coronary artery is that the lumen is filled with atherosclerotic plaque. And this is the type artery that 50% of us have in our bodies before we cross the river, so to speak. Now this visual shows that the atherosclerotic process is not limited to a single artery in our bodies, uh, but it involves most of our arteries, unfortunately. Now this particular slide focuses on the coronary arteries. Now these are the arteries, uh, of course, which perfuse our mu heart muscle with blood. And in this particular uh, visual, the four major coronary arteries are shown. This shows that uh, if we could put all of these four coronary arteries together, about a third of their links are narrowed greater than 75% in cross-sectional area. Another third uh, is narrowed uh, also approximately uh, 35%. So the process is not, uh, uh, does not involve just a single segment of a single artery, but it involves our arteries diffusely. Now, I'm a cholesterol person. As far as I'm concerned, the link between cholesterol and atherosclerosis is a very firm one. Now, these are the six factors, in my view, which show beyond any reasonable doubt that the link between cholesterol and atherosclerosis is a firm one. It would hold up, in my view, in any court in any land. Factor one here uh, shows that atherosclerosis is produced if we feed certain animals, namely rats, a high-fat diet. Now, this experimental production of atherosclerosis started about 80 years ago, and it was a Russian, a niche cow, who identified in this high-fat diet uh, that, it, that cholesterol was present. Factor two, uh, the biochemist then came in and found by analyzing these atherosclerotic plaques, whether they were in rabbits or whether they were in people, uh, found cholesterol in the plaques. Item three uh, really uh, began after World War II when Ansel Keys and his colleagues went to various nations around the world and found that people who had atherosclerosis uh, had cholesterol levels uh, generally over 200 milligrams per deciliter, whereas the populations who did not have atherosclerosis had total cholesterol levels usually under 150 or at least in the vicinity of 150. The interesting thing, or one of the important things about cholesterol, is that items four, five, and six in this visual have really been confirmed in this decade. Item four uh, indicates that, that uh, whether or not we get atherosclerosis is proportional to our level of cholesterol in our blood. And the higher that total cholesterol level, the greater the chance of our having symptomatic atherosclerotic disease, the greater the chance of our dying from atherosclerotic disease, and the greater the extent of the atherosclerotic plaques in our bodies. Number five uh, uh, came about in January 1984, and that study indicated that if we lower our total cholesterol, and specifically the low-density cholesterol, that our chance of having a heart attack uh, is lessened. In item six, at least the best study came in June 1988, and that is if we lower our blood total and LDL cholesterol levels, that, our, that some of our atherosclerotic plaques at least will shrink in size and others will at least not progress in size. So in my view, any way we look at this connection between cholesterol and atherosclerotic plaques, indeed it is a firm one. Now this is the summary uh, slide from Ansel Key's famous Seven Nation study. And what it shows is that certain people, people living in certain countries on our planet, for example, uh, Japan and Greece, have a very low frequency of, 
of atherosclerotic disease and, and specifically coronary disease, whereas other people living in other countries like USA and Finland have a very high frequency of coronary disease. Now Ansel Keys concluded from this, and these took a number of years, that the cholesterol was the villain. As shown here, people in Jap southern Japan, the group that he studied, had a mean total cholesterol level of, of approximately 150 milligrams per deciliter, whereas the people in Finland who had uh, the, war the highest frequency of sclerosis of any group he studied had a total cholesterol level approaching, on an average, 300 milligrams per deciliter. Now he concluded from those studies that this indeed was a cholesterol problem. Now this is the, shown in this visual is a wonderful study that came out of Chicago. This is the so-called Mr. Fit study. Uh, this particular study was published in 1986. And the beauty of this study is that uh, uh, something like over 350,000 people were involved in the study. These were all men. Uh, they, they entered the study when they were asymptomatic, no evidence of heart disease. Uh, they ranged from age 35 to 57, and all of them had their total cholesterol levels measured. And what this study shows is that as that total cholesterol goes up, 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 and up, uh, the frequency of coronary artery disease goes up, up, and up. No, no study shows it better that our total cholesterol, and specifically the LDL cholesterol, is simply a quantity, and the higher that quantity, the greater the risk. Now this uh, very bu vi uh, busy uh, visual here shows the two studies which have shown that if we lower our total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol levels, that our chances of having a heart attack diminish. The one on the left is the so-called lipid research uh, clinic study. Uh, this cost Americans $158 million. It'll never be repeated. Uh, these patients, uh, approximately 4,000 men, were divided into two groups. One half of them were treated with the cholestyramine and the other half were given a placebo. And at the end of seven years, there was a 19% reduction in heart attack in the group which had been allocated to receive drug therapy. About 30% of them quit taking the drug. Nevertheless, they stayed in that arm. The right is the Helsinki Heart Study. This study is even better in my judgment. Uh, these uh, 4,000 men approximately, again, were divided into two groups. One half were treated uh, with gem Brazil, but again, about 30% of them quit taking the drug after a while. And at the end of five years, there was a 34% reduction in heart attack frequency compared to the placebo group. In other words, both of these studies are analyzed in a very conservative manner, and both show, beyond any reasonable doubt, that if we lower our total, and specifically the LDL cholesterol level, that our chances of heart attack, and these were very hard endpoints, namely acute myocardial infarction, non-fatal, and death from coronary disease, that those will be diminished. Now, this slide uh, actually shows what those studies uh, uh, indicated. And that is, for every 1% that we lower our total cholesterol in the serum or in the plasma, our heart attack uh, frequency diminishes two, two to three times. So if we lower our total cholesterol by 10 uh, percent in the serum, heart attack frequency diminishes 20 percent or according to the Helsinki Heart Study, about 30 percent. So it does pay to lower that cholesterol level. Now this slide shows a study that came out of Bogalusa, Louisiana. These investigators studied the aorta of people in necropsy. They would take the aorta out, open it up, pin it out on a cork board, and plane out the animal surface area covered by atherosclerotic plaque. And what this shows is, as our LDL cholesterol level goes up, up, and up, the amount of atherosclerotic plaque in our aorta goes up, up, and up. 
Now this is the title page of the best of the three major reversibility studies. This is a study by Blankenhorn and his associates. It came out in June 1987. And what they did was, uh, to, was study a, a group of 162 people who had already had a bypass operation. And they did coronary angiograms in them, and then half of the patients were treated with cholesterol and uh, niacin, the other half were given placebo. At the end of two years, they repeated those coronary angiograms, and what they found is that the group treated with drug uh, had, a, had a higher frequency of progression compared to the placebo group. This was significant. And secondly, they had a lower frequency of progression. In other words, uh, atherosclerotic plaques in some of the patients uh, shrank, and in others, there was no, there was no worsening uh, of the narrowing. So this study suggests strongly that, that even in people who have atherosclerotic plaques, that it's possible uh, to shrink them and to prevent them from getting worse. Now let me spend a couple of minutes here on nutrition, and I don't claim to be a nutrition uh, expert. Uh, but obviously, in my view, uh, what we put in our mouth is primarily determining our fate. Now this is a slide which summarizes three different studies from three different groups of investigators. Each of these lines represents a different group. And what this study shows is, as our total cholesterol goes up, up, and up, our, uh, no, as our cholesterol intake in our diet goes up, up, and up, the cholesterol in our blood goes up, up, and up. So one of the ways to increase our total cholesterol level is simply to eat the stuff. But I don't worry quite as much about cholesterol as I do fat. I think these books having the title Low Cholesterol Diet really should be Low Fat Diet. Fat is the villain. And the reason I say that is that if we look at this slide, the amount of cholesterol that the average American adult takes in is only about a half a gram a day. And if we would give up the eggs, the visible and the non-visible ones we eat, we would eliminate half the cholesterol we take in. If we gave up red meat, we'd eliminate approximately another third. Fat, on the other hand, almost all Americans take in over 100 grams of fat, many of us uh, over 150 grams of fat, and in essence, about a third of the fat that we take in is saturated. And to look at it very simplistically, that saturated fat we take in, approximately 40 grams a day, that is converted in our bodies to cholesterol. So fat is the main source of our cholesterol, not the direct cholesterol that we take in. Uh, the major source of the fats are these uh, oils and and fats that we put on so many of our foods, and red meat is the second major villain. Now these are a list of various fatty acids. Now not all the fats we eat are bad. They all have uh, a lot of calories in them, but again, it's the saturated ones that are bad. Shown on the bottom uh, right here is coconut oil, for example, and that's about the worst thing we can put in our mouths. That's 92% saturated fat. All those fatty acids on the right are bad for us because saturated uh, portion is so high. Those on the left, on the other hand, are good for us. Take olive oil. Our grandmothers knew what they were doing. Olive oil is 77% monounsaturated. That's good for us. That actually lowers our cholesterol levels a little bit. Peanut butter, peanut oil is not bad either. That's 40 8% monounsaturated. The problem is we've got to use peanut butter as a meal, not as a snack. Let me uh, mention this fast food business. As you know, in this country, the fast food industry is a $50 billion industry. 20% of all Americans eat their lunch every day at a fast food chain. Michael, uh, uh, Fritchner, M Michael Jacobson and Sarah Fritchner from Washington, D.C. three years ago wrote this book called A Fast Food Guide uh, which uh, describes the ingredients of some of the foods supplied by the fast food industry. Now, the one on the bottom there, this is a list of, 
of the ingredients in hamburgers. Now the Wendy's triple deck, triple deck uh, cheeseburger, that's the coronary artery bypass special, folks. And it's closely followed by the Burger King double beef whopper with cheese. Now in each of those two hamburgers, we're talking about a thousand calories. And if you take those hamburgers and squeeze them real hard, it comes up with about 15 teaspoons of fat in each of those hamburgers. Uh, and the sodium content is terribly high, something like 1,200 to 1,800 milligram, uh, milligrams of sodium are present in each of those hamburgers. Now, French fries are, are also bad uh, uh, for us. A, a baked potato is one of the best things we can eat. It averages about 100 calories, but if you chop it up and cook it in beef tallow, and most of these fast food chains cook them in beef tallow, uh, it can quadruple uh, the caloric count of those baked potatoes uh, very readily. Uh, here's a, a list of some of the uh, liquids we drink at uh, some of the fast food industries. The Dairy Queen uh, 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 milkshake has approximately a thousand uh, uh, calories in it, another uh, five or six teaspoons of saturated fat, and over 300 milligrams of sodium. So we have to be very careful uh, with this fast food uh, business. Now this is a slide simply on, uh, on McDonald's. I think McDonald's is a, fa a fine company. I don't see anything wrong with eating fast, but I think we can eat better, and I think they're gonna be the leader in, in changing what they serve us here. Uh, as you see from this slide, uh, something like 50% of Americans eat, uh, live within three minutes of a McDonald's restaurant. Something like 96% of Americans eat at a, a, at a uh, McDonald's chain sometime during the course of the year. A McDonald's is the biggest uh, purchaser or killer of uh, cows in the world. Same with uh, uh, chickens almost. They're the biggest purchaser of the potato crop. Uh, they're the biggest trainer of uh, workers in, in, in this country. So this is a, uh, this is a competitor uh, for uh, health in this country. Now this is a statement by William Collins, which I think is an important one. Uh, the carnivorous animals, and I am afraid we as human beings are really not, have an almost unlimited capacity to eat saturated fats and cholesterol. Whereas the herbivorous animals uh, uh, can, can eat, uh, uh, the, con the, conev the carnivorous animals, which we're not, uh, have a very limited capacity to eat cholesterol and saturated fat, whereas the herbivorous animals uh, uh, can eat it with uh, immunity. Uh, if you take a, a dog, for example, a dog can eat a half of a pound of butter every day and, and get no atherosclerosis whatsoever. But if you give just a, a gram of cholesterol to a rabbit uh, every day for just a couple of months, you can produce a yellow atherosclerotic plaques with no problem. Uh, so I think that human beings really are more like rabbits uh, than dogs, and we have to be very careful uh, with eating uh, so much uh, uh, meat. Now this is a slide which shows some of the diseases that pure vegetarians don't get and diseases which meat eaters get. For example, the pure vegetarians over many, many years, they don't get atherosclerosis. The pure vegetarians don't get systemic hypertension. The pure vegetarians don't get diabetes. They don't uh, get obesity. They're not obese. They're not bothered by peptic ulcer, um, hemorrhoids, diverticulosis, uh, and some of the uh, uh, other intestinal disorders that many of us get. Pure vegetarians don't get gallstones, they don't get kidney stones, they don't get osteoarthritis, even rheumatoid arthritis, and certainly pure vegetarians are not uh, bothered by trichinosis and salmonellosis. So it's very easy to improve the health of us in the USA. We've just got to change what we put in our mouths. And if we put less meat and fat in our mouths, we, we would, our health would skyrocket. Thanks, Bill. As I understand what you're saying, the, the connection between cholesterol and atherosclerosis is as firm as any connection in medicine might be. 
Fifty percent of Americans suffer from the consequences of atherosclerosis, yet it's a preventable condition in 499 out of 500 Americans. It seems like the problem is um, not related to genetics, but rather is related to what we put in our mouths. Absolutely. Um, it's unfortunate that it's not related to genetics, and most of us, if, we, if it was genetic, there would be nothing really we could do about it. Uh, only one out of every 500 people, as you indicate, is it a major genetic uh, disorder. And the rest of us, unfortunately, it's what we put in our mouths uh, that primarily determine our, that determines our cholesterol level. Well, then what can we do about cholesterol and how can we lower it? Well, the major thing is to be careful what we put in our mouths. Mm -hmm. I used to uh, think that that it was the person in the kitchen that was determining our health. I really think that's wrong. It's the person who does the shopping uh, that's determining our health. And we've got to bring the right foods uh, uh, in our house. And it, it, it's not so difficult. Um, if we're just conscious of all the fat in the foods. Mm -hmm. um, I've cut down, for example, uh, uh, meat. When I found out what a devastating uh, thing that the seed is doing to our bodies. Uh, you know, here we, we take the cattle in this country and we kill a hundred thousand cows every day in this country. Uh, they're placed in these feedlots for two months to six months before they're, they're slaughtered and in those feedlots they're given something like 22 pounds of grain every day. Now what that does is make these animals very, very fat. Uh, and then we eat the fatty animals and uh, they kill us. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a very uh, vicious cycle. So we can improve what we eat uh, enormously. Some of the processed foods are loaded with sugar, loaded with salt, and we also have to be a bit careful uh, with some of them. Yeah. So uh, don't even bring it into the house. Um, and also That's my view. Yeah, prevention is, is the best way to do, to go about it. But um, what about those of us who have, have disregarded or not known about preventing cholesterol? Are there any drugs that can help lower cholesterol or prevent yeah. atherosclerosis? Well, we have a, uh, we're in a new era now. Mm -hmm. uh, the drugs uh, to lower cholesterol uh, are really wonderful uh, now. Uh, all of them are effective 